um, this is more related to when I was a college athlete, um, but maybe some of the rookies who are playing pro can relate to this, or um, for those who are more seasoned, you can probably relate to it as well. But I think a really vulnerable moment I had with myself as an athlete was my freshman and sophomore year. So I was a rookie um, at UNC Chapel Hill. And, you know, I came from like where I lived, I was like the best player in the state of South Carolina. And I came in and I could not compete. So like having that vulnerable moment of like, oh, I'm actually like comparatively not good. And like being able to admit that to myself <laughs> and say like, get out of my head, like stop, like, you know, I, I had an ego at the time, like you're gonna have to work really, 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 really hard. And like, it's gonna suck, but like, truthfully, like you're just not there yet. I think that's like the one vulnerable moment that I like probably the first time in my life where I really was like, damn, like you're gonna have to work your ass off if you want any amount of like fruit or like playing time. If you wanna see the fruit of like anything from this college experience, you're gonna have to work your butt off. Um, so yeah. And then that's happened a few other times in my life in different situations, like career wise and stuff like that too. So one, one moment was, uh... At the beginning of my pro career, I had to learn to communicate with people. Uh, I was used to be in a college situation where we became we kind of almost family, then go to another country, perhaps another language, and not being able to communicate. Then perhaps you think that just the essential is, is enough, but uh, your teammates need to know what you're feeling. That moment I wasn't expressing myself. I was just communicating the essential things in the, in the court. I just, the balls, how I want the balls, everything like that, but nothing else. Then that was the biggest step for me to do because I was, a, I was alone. I was knowing my family, that was my, my college team. And this, I think, helped me to, to grow as, a, as an athlete and as a person. One of my most vulnerable times was um, going into the USA national team gym and kind of that same type of thing, being surrounded by a lot of people that were much better than you and having to uh, really kind of reevaluate where you were and um, how I was going to approach it. And so I went back and uh, kind of looked at it. I got cut. I was in there for two summers and then got cut. Um, after that, and then had an opportunity to go back into the gym in the summer and play for two summers after that. And in between that time, I felt like I grew a lot in my goal setting and my expectation process. And actually the time in between being in the gym was uh, the best for me. It was a really humbling experience the first time in and then kind of really working on my goal setting and um, how I was gonna approach it and even my confidence um, just in general, really set me up for the next time that opportunity was available to me. I was similar to Sonia. I was um, with USA. I had mentioned from 2000, actually it was 2000. I tried out in 2000 and, and got cut, didn't make the team. And so 2001, I was actually invited back to be with USA Volleyball. And um, from then until 2010, but I never made an Olympic. So that's three Olympics that I didn't make. And volleyball for me, my goal was to be an Olympian period. So much so that it, I didn't realize it, but my identity was in if I was going to make the Olympic team or not. And so my huge vulnerability was in 2008 when I realized it's basically over. That was your chance to make the Olympic team. As far as I was concerned, that's it. And so I did get invited back in 2010, but it was really a surprise to me. I didn't expect it. So after 2008, I was crushed because as far as I was concerned, I was a failure. And that's where um, Connect With Your Gift has come from. And I will talk about that later, probably at some point or whatever. But um, understanding that I had put my identity in what I did and not in who I was. And so that was my most vulnerable moment was in 2008 when I didn't make it and I realized there are no more chances, you know. Every time I got cut before that, I thought, okay, well, just go back and work harder. I can get it. I can still reach my goal. But that was like ultimate failure. And I thought I was a failure. 
So it was learning from that moment on that I'm not what I do. And I just want to ask, um, Therese, just as like a follow up, what did you do to overcome that? Cry a lot. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Um, you know what? You don't, I didn't really have a choice. I had to live, right? But I was really lost for a very, very long time because not only had I realized that I had played volleyball or played some sports since I, I literally had played some sports since I was three years old. So I had started with gymnastics when I was three years. I didn't know life outside of volleyball or some kind of sport. And um, I just had to start, but it was very slow and it was quite a journey and it was just not having another choice, but to be and then slowly start to just uh, find life. <laughs> yeah, I would have to say like, I can't think of right now the moment that it kind of clicked. I do remember, but that might be a long story. But it was a moment when I was asked to speak and somebody had asked me to speak about my career. They had, I didn't tell anybody I played volleyball because as far as I was concerned, my whole volleyball career was a failure because I didn't make the Olympic team. So I didn't think anybody wanted to hear about me. I didn't think I had anything to offer anyone. I was the failure. I wasn't the Olympian. I wasn't the one that was successful. I was the failure. So nobody wants to hear from me. I'm not good. And so I didn't tell anybody. Like people met me. I never said anything that I'd ever played volleyball, or anything like that. And somebody found out and he asked me to talk. And so I sat down and I was like, oh gosh, okay, what am I going to say? And so I sat down and started to write down a list of all of the things that I was successful in and all the things that I had failed in. And I realized that that failure list was quite short compared to the things that I, but I couldn't see that until I made that list. As far as I was concerned, I was a failure. But when I saw that list, I started to realize, wait, you didn't really fail that much. <laughs> Your life has been a lot more than just those couple of failures. And that was the beginning of an awakening for me. I smirked a little bit because I just had January blues, which I feel like that's a term that my husband and I used. My husband came with me when I played overseas and January was always tough. It just was a brutal month, dark, not usually not a lot of games, um, all those kinds of things. And so uh, even not playing this year, I felt like I had January blues where you just kind of reevaluate what you're going through where you are halfway through the season. And um, for me, I really felt like journaling helped a lot. And I really feel like these panels, this is something I would have loved to have um, when I was going through those years, um, just to really reach out and find somebody that has like circumstances, you know, similar circumstances that kind of just that comfort in uh, building each other up, not necessarily in the um, complaining or the, you know, expressing all the difficult times, but finding people that can build you up, I think is great. So for me, journaling and um, really making an effort to explore the area that I was in just really brought a fresh perspective. And so um, those were those were important things for me always in January and February. Sonia, I, I used to, especially yeah, these months are really dark and you don't want to go out because it's so cold. But then we tend to stay at home. I, I used to stay at home watching movies, and, but I discovered that traveling around, just in the city, just often different views of what I was living, then meet the city in that, in that situation where it's raining. Also, I found beauty in that. Then I, I tried to, to do that, to even uh, push myself to, to go with my teammates outside because they say, oh, uh, Lord, come out. No, no, I just want to stay at home and then the blankets, everything very warm. But I push myself to go, go, just just go out that spring is coming. And also doing some visualization. I know that may sound a little bit like, oh, but visualization is great. You think yourself like the best moment of the year for me, summer. I see myself in that moment and that kind of gives me a little energy to, to go through this wet and dark days. <laughs> Um, so the Virago project did an Instagram live with the sports counselor earlier this week, and she talked about how to find accessible and, 
um, the right therapist for you. If you're a woman athlete, she does a lot of work with women athletes and she gave us this really good resource. Um, and I know not everyone here, um, is from the U S but I know like a good number of us are. So if you are overseas and you are, uh, a U.S. citizen, then you should definitely check out the link that I just put into the chat. It's called Open Path Collective, and it's a nonprofit organization um, that tries to provide or match like just normal people with therapists who don't necessarily like you don't have to have health insurance. Um, you don't have to do like any crazy signups. You don't have to be there in person. They can do like telehealth and stuff and you can like use all of the different filters or whatever you need to find the right therapist for you. So like while you're in Europe in like the cold, dark January, February, March, winter months, you can like maybe get connected with someone um, who is like a licensed mental health professional and um, it's pretty cheap. I think it's like, if, if you want to invest in it, it's a $59 like annual membership and then therapy sessions cost like 30 bucks and that's only like, it's 30 bucks every single time you want to get therapy. So that's less than $200. Um, so yeah, I just put that in there if you want to check it out. I actually, <laughs> after Christmas, like getting to Christmas to me was always hard, but after Christmas, I always I got a severity because I knew I was, I don't know. I think mentally, I just figured we're halfway done. And um, I don't know, just, just for me, Chris gave, always gave me, I always went home for Christmas. That was kind of like a must do. I mean, I did some stupid stuff and made some stupid decisions that I pressed teams like, oh no, I'm going home for Christmas. And that wasn't always wise because I missed, I've missed a game before because I told the team, look, I'm going home for Christmas. Um, it, but it did give me mental health. It was huge. Christmas at my house with my family was huge. So when I went back, I always had a really fresh, ready to go. We are, it's all downhill from here as far as the, the season is going that I'm going to be. And so I was always refreshed. But one thing um, I will say that helped me a lot was when I um, had friends that had nothing to do with volleyball from the country that I was in so that I would go out with them and do things that they didn't, they knew, I mean, they might've known something about volleyball, but they were not volleyball people. They weren't volleyball fans of the team. They were just normal people from that country and go and they would play tourist with me or they would just take me home to their house and I would have dinner with them or you know, we would go have dinner together and we weren't talking about volleyball. So that uh, I didn't realize it, but that was really good for me just to have an out of doing something besides volleyball. I liked fashion, go shopping all the time. I really loved to go shopping and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so that was just my mental break, I think. Listening to a really interesting podcast, um, it doesn't really like relate to mental health and like the January blues, but um, it's called Burn It All Down. And it's a podcast that's hosted by um, former women athletes who talk about like, just like the women's sports landscape on a whole. And so they come out with like, I think two episodes a week um, and they'll talk about like news and sport. They'll talk about like prominent, like news and women's sports, prominent women athletes and like what they're doing, what's going on with like some of the bigger brands in sport, but like they look through everything. They, they like analyze everything through like a feminist lens, um, which I love. I don't know if you guys would be interested into it, but they totally roast like people on this podcast. And sometimes like you just need to listen to something that's like relatable and funny and also educational. And like, that is definitely a podcast that you could start your mornings to that is like totally, I mean, it, it, it's like up every woman athlete's alley, I think. It should be at least, it's really good and it's empowering. So I'll put that in the chat as well. At uh, Legacy by James Kerr. And it was a really kind of quick read. Um, it's about the rugby team, about a rugby team. And it just was really great about I felt like it revisited the idea of like why you play the game and mantras and um, talking about pressure and it kind of, it's kind of uh, segmented into 15 chapters and uh, you can just bust out of the chapter pretty easily but like it gave a lot of good tools uh, kind of to refocus yourself if you're looking for um, yeah some more motivation for the rest of the season or 
something like that. So I can put it in the chat as well. Yeah. I'm going to tag off of Taylor kind of. I was going to say I have a group called Women Who Gather. I'm very spiritual. I'm a Christian and I'm very spiritual. But the point is that I found my tribe. I found some place where I feel like um, that feeds me, that I can feed, that I'm a part of a community. These are my girls. Like I met them one time. We went to Kenya together. That's a place to meet. But um, they're just people that I can vibe with. We get each other. We go deep. You know, we got spiritual and we go deep. We talk about experiences that other people might not relate to or couldn't understand, you know, but there are some women that I can get really vulnerable with and they can get vulnerable with me. And we, it's a vibe place. And I think that is something great. It, it might not be women who gather for you. It might be the place that Taylor was talking about that podcast. Maybe that's not for you, but if you can find a place where you're a part of a community that you vibe with. Here's elite, this is awesome, this is elite fam. But if you can find somewhere else, even that's outside of volleyball, something else that you're passionate about and you find that tribe that allows you to go there and explore another part of yourself besides the athlete, you know, that it, it just will, I think it will just allow you to flourish. I love um, Beyond Athletic because we are so much more than just the athletics. That's one talent, but we know it won't last forever, but we are expressing ourselves who we are through the talent, but it's not who we are, right? And so being able to find another area that you have when the talent sometimes is not working out, <laughs> that you have another area that you can, you know, still get life from, because sometimes in the team, it's not working out, right? And if that's your everything, oh, but if you have somewhere else to go that you are still getting life and able to give life, that's, that's a great thing. So find your people. That's what I would say. I would say, remember when you were playing on a team when you were one of the best players on the team? I want you to think about how you were, what was your mental talk to yourself during that time? And what would, how did you feel when somebody would say something negative, probably equal, equal, even say something. It was probably rare because you were one of the best players. But when somebody would say something, what would be your mental talk? when they would say that to you, when you were one of the best players on the team. Because a lot, I wish I would have known this. Oh my gosh, I wish I would have known this. I'm pulling from my experience when I was not one of the best players on the team. And I, get, I got to compare the two later once I was done playing. And my mindset, what I realized, it was how I perceived myself, how much I took it in. Because I played in Puerto Rico toward the end of my career and there were some girls on the team and Lord have mercy. I wanted to fight, literally physically fight them outside because like, who are you to be talking to me like this? But I was taken, but when I was in my, at Hawaii, let's say when I was one of the star players and the girls were talking, somebody would say something. I was like, okay, watch this, <laughs> you know, let me show you something. Oh, you want to talk? I didn't need to say a word. I was so confident that my mentality was like, oh, you think you can talk? Okay, watch because my mindset was different as to my confidence about myself. So I just want you to try to think about how you feel about yourself mentally, because this is a different situation. You stepped into another, this is your first year pro, you said. And so this is another level, but your mindset and your confidence, you need to take the same mindset that you had when you were one of the best players and put it into this situation, okay? So it's not a problem with them. You don't focus on them because you can't change them but you can work on you and say, okay, I'm still the same player. I'm still the same player. I'm still the same person. My confidence is not gonna be shaken because of where I'm at. And I'm, you know what I mean? You don't have to go in confrontation, but you, your self-talk can be, okay, all right, I got you, I got you, you know? Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Elena, um, one part that I will say to you will be my experience. And the other part, we enter the, the coach. <laughs> the, the first is, I remember when I had my teammates and they were not playing, they were the, second, the third middle blocker, I was middle blocker. And I always say to them, don't think and don't practice like you are in the bench. You always have to think that you are a starting player. Doesn't matter if you right now are not playing. But that will enforce your mentality, give you power. And about what they say, that teach me a coach, a, a mental coach, say, that is a concern to you. When somebody says to you, I don't know, something rude, you can think, 
in, in your head. That doesn't concern to me. She's saying that because, I don't know, but that doesn't touch me because it doesn't concern to me. And you can visualize, visualize you doing that or how you feel better. But what I was trying to, to say, and sometimes I did in my career, was literally thinking myself, saying, I don't care. I don't care. You can talk. It doesn't concern to me. And this is my advice. And always think like you are the best because right now it's one position. The next year, change things and you practice very hard. You are going to arrive where you want to arrive. Hey, everyone. I wanted to just jump in really quickly and say something. Um, I love what Therese just said and uh, Zoo, you too. That was great. I figure every time I was playing and I came up against negativity, I actually never realized how negative I could seem on the court because I would be so frustrated sometimes with myself. So that was another perspective. Like Therese, you get these how you were and then understand like, okay, what was actually worthwhile or what wasn't. But for me, every time somebody was negative on the court, um, it's a combination of what both ladies said. It's, it, what came to, it became a competition for me. So A, I had to realize like later, okay, those people actually are just blocked in some way and they are expressing themselves and they actually probably care about this as much as I do. But that's not what I was thinking in those moments. That's what I'm thinking after the fact, right? That's like, okay, fine. In the moment, I would just think, okay, it's on. And that is literally how I would play. I would play uh, whether I was the best person on that team for sure or whether I was trying to be. For me, it just became, I'm going to prove through my actions all the time. And, and I won't, I'll just be relentless AF. You know, I'm, I'm not going to let you, uh, your talk can continue, your actions can continue, but you will be silenced by the fact that I don't have to say anything and I don't have to um, even acknowledge the, the energy you're giving me by giving you back that energy. I can actually just, okay, I understand you feel that way and leave it at that and then go play my butt off, right? My ass off. That's my, my like, because I, I watch you, you know, and we talk about this and the first time we met and it's like, I see this super gentle creature and, and, and it's like, Yelena, I need you to bring out this beast inside of you, you know, because that's what's going to take you far, right? Playing and like enjoying the sport and whatever is like one thing and this is such a, an amateur mentality because we are learning about why we even love this sport. And then when you transition to pro and some people get that beforehand, but then you transition to pro and you realize how cutthroat it is and you realize all these different things are going on and nothing else matters than you just doing your job to your security and your advancement in your career. And so at some point, it's like you might be meditating, you might be sleeping, you might be awake and it'd be after a match and you just got killed and you came in and you had like 2% hitting and you are pissed off at yourself. And then you realize I need to channel everything that I'm feeling when it's negative for myself or it's negative from somebody else, I've got to channel it into just flipping the switch on and saying it's on, it's competition time. And if you're always competing, then you don't even have time to feel what these people are trying to put on you. That would be my advice. So that's a great question. I love that you asked that. And hi, big hug. Thank nice you. seeing you on TV this week. Oh, really I gotta good. say this. Um, about what Ryan was saying too, because, and this is, I know this is not what he meant, but I just, it made me remember how I used to do to, to uh, counter that. And it wasn't good. So I wanna make sure, I think this might apply to more people too on this um, elite. And I wanna stop you from going, from going into this. You'll watch this in professional sports all the time. When people try to play angry, that's false confidence, right? When you try to play like, uh, just to get pumped up or try to, but really it's fear that you're not good enough. So you try to turn on the emotional anger and it's draining as heck. And most people can't maintain that. The problem with that is you can maintain that for so long, but it takes so much energy to be angry for and maintain that level of emotional, I don't even know what you call that, um, negativity. It, basically it's negative. It's not the positive thing, but it's a false confidence. 
And that's why I said, Yelena, remember when you were playing your best, when you were the top on the team, remember that mindset, the mindset that you had. Because I said, now it's on, but that was my mindset. It wasn't that I felt like I needed to get angry at them. It was just, I knew inside my heart, I can do this and I'm not intimidated. It wasn't where when I wasn't confident, then it became, let me show you because I wasn't confident. So I needed to pretend it was false confidence. I needed to uh, prove to you that I'm good enough. You understand there's a big difference between I need to prove to you versus I already know, now let me show you. Do you hear the difference? It's huge because if you try to fake it, you can only fake it for so long, but the biggest problem is you don't believe it yourself. And you'll want coaches to think you're good enough and say, give me a chance. You'll want your teammates to, to believe in you and say, my teammates are not working with me. They don't believe in me. But the problem really is that you don't believe in yourself. And that's where I was toward the end of my career. But when I was my most successful and my most confident, I didn't need other people to believe in me. I believed in me to show them, to produce the results. And so I want you to spend some time thinking about what you used to say to yourself, how you used to, what, um, what Lorena was saying, visualize yourself, watch videos. I used to have to go back and watch old videos of myself playing great because it put me back in that feeling of what it felt like to dominate. Go back if you have any videos, ask for videos of when you just dominated and what that felt like and how, then when you can get back into that mentality, it will shift things for you on the outside. You'll start seeing that because it's coming from within you instead of you trying to be something. You don't have to try to be you are or you wouldn't be there. You already are good enough. You already are great. You're just going to show it at a different level. That's all. That's all. This could go for not just, you know, uh, I'm going to use the word toxic, but not. Okay, negative players. Um, okay, negative coaches. I think everyone has a situation, some point where a coach is just ragging for no, you know, consistently for weeks and you're just like come on dude you know you're killing me or telling you you're too happy I know this is a situation it's happened to me it's happened to some of the players on here you need to be less happy all the time I think there comes a point where you need to just put your blinders up and work and if that's what keeps you going and keeps you playing well be as happy as you want how is someone going to tell you to be not happy when you're playing you know like this is your life, you move to a different country, you leave your family to do this. Like, how is someone to tell you these things? So I think when people are negative or, you know, coaches are negative, teammates are negative, there comes a point where you just put your blinders up and you just, you know what, talk to the hand, like I'm doing my job. And, you know, it's, it's in the end, it's your business. It's not theirs. And if they want to be negative, they can be negative by themselves in the corner. Like you're going to keep playing. So I think Nika right now, I believe you're using this season to recover, to come back to the game, feel that, have that feeling with your body, trusting again your body. Then I, I will advise you to keep focusing on that. It's not easy to change the total the mentality of the entire, entire club. But you can keep going with that mentality that you start the season. You, your goal is to get better, to, to get the, the rhythm that you have before. Understand that you cannot get it with the club that you are right now. But perhaps, I don't know, can you do something outside the practice? To kind of make yeah, you I'm feel doing that, a lot of stuff mm -hmm. like on the side just because of it. But I just feel like practices are so major and so important for me because yeah. like viable practices are helping me to like be better but I'm doing like other stuff on the side like how to be mentally strong or just like mentally okay with that like emotionally and physically well I would like to ask you what is stressing you the most the future that perhaps you are not going to find the trap that you saw before, or right now, the situation right now. What is stressing you the most? The most thing that is stressing me is just because I can't perform my best right now that I'm not going to be able to like experience like playing for a good club or just like finding something else in Europe because I want to have that experience. 
Okay. By experience, I can tell you that if that is what stresses you the most, that should not be. Because I know, I know, as, a, as an athlete, we stress about that. But don't worry, because clubs know how you play. They will, they will not focus on right now. They will understand. But they know you as a player. Then right now, what I advise you to focus is in your body, in your mind, and in the future, but not in a, post, a negative way that, oh, I will not find. You are going to find that. You are going to find the club because they know how you play. And this moment, use it as a recover, as to recover. I don't know if that helps you, but focus just on your goals and your strategies. I think that's so good what Lorena said. And I would say that you, like she said, what you focus on, right now you will manifest that if you don't shift your, your mind. So what I'm hearing, because I'm all about confidence because I didn't have any. So that's where my passion comes from is seeing the difference from when I had confidence and when I didn't. When we don't, this injury has made you to kind of lose confidence. And when she asked you, what is the major problem? It's really not with the team's level. It's that, am I going to be good enough? right? So it's kind of brought your confidence level down. And when we have a low confidence, we look for what we can get from something else. So then our, your focus is, what can I get from this team that's going to make me better? Instead of, I am good, I make, I'm getting better by getting healthy. You see how your mind is shifted? It'll play a game on you. And all of a sudden, because your confidence is lifted, somebody else needs, you need something from the outside to make you good enough, instead of knowing you're good enough. You see what I'm saying? You would never think that before when you were healthy and you were going through the team in Slovenia. You don't need them to make you better, right? But it'll play exactly. with you because, yeah, you don't need them to make you better. You would be, okay, let me get some reps in the gym or whatever, but you don't need the coach to be good. You don't need, the, but because of the injury, it's kind of made your confidence go down. And now you look to the outside to help you to, okay, I need somebody to help me. I need some, this has got to, because I'm not there. So you just got to see that for what it is and know that you can give, you can be there to give. You're somebody's only opportunity to see that level. Some of those girls you're planting seeds in, in your home country, you're getting to plant seeds in girls that will never get to see that level. You are there, their story that they will tell. I played months with Nika Markovic. You know what I mean? I, I got to play with her once I was in the gym with her once I got to see you sorry there's a reason that you're there but for you to sit think of for yourself also is okay now I'm here to get healthy because I know what I can do so I'm getting healthy that's it that's all you're doing I'm getting healthy I don't need anybody to make me better because I'm good I, I had an injury it did not take anything away from me don't let that play with your game because what it can do is you start thinking that way that will continue to go into and you will self-manifest then you will go to a team Right. Because like Lorena said, coaches know that they know that players get injured. They're looking, they know your history. So they're going to give you a chance. You're going to get a chance. But if you go with the mentality that you need somebody else to make you better, you'll go. And when you get the chance, you won't be able to do what you normally can do because you're looking for them to validate you. I've done it. <laughs> this is from experience. I wanted to chime in with this. Um, Nika, I know we talked a lot before you came on and, and, you're doing a lot of work on the side, like you said. I want you to make sure that you keep the point of view that your, your time with everything that was just said, so valid, I love it all. And I think that if you think about this perspective that what you're doing right now is shaping who you want to be in the future and how you're going to be that person. And so when you stay and you stick to this kind of like idea of, okay, I've built this, these new steps, right? what I can manage. I've got a sports psych, I, I'm reading this, I'm doing that. Um, and then I have these hurdles, but my hurdles are always gonna change. But what I don't want to be always changing is what I'm doing. And so one of the things that she was just mentioning, and I love this about manifesting, I think that your self-talk and that confidence thing has to be definitely strong, but even stronger than that has to be what you, you try to do more often than what you don't try to do. And so in trainings like this, because I can, I can give the other side, I was not a good player coming out of college. I barely knew how to play volleyball coming out of college. And then I was always working up. So I always played on crap teams. I never knew what a great team was until I got to pro and I started 
training with some other teams, right? Because I would write them in the first leagues and try to come to their trainings and whatever. And then when I got to the national team, it was another kind of level, another kind of level. It was a completely different universe for levels. And what I realized throughout that is that at some point during um, when I was new to volleyball, I always would have competitions with myself. And since I was really, really shy, I wasn't having them in the beginning with other people, but then it evolved. That. So what I try to do is like, I'd find somebody in the gym who is the best server. Um, if I was that person, I would choose the next best server because I wanted somebody to compete with me. And I would just like make a friendly competition between us two that maybe nobody else was even aware of during the trainings to bring out not only that person's strengths, but my strengths, because it's so easy to get lost in these crap trainings, these crap like attitudes and blah, blah, blah. But if you, sh you shape the approach that you have to the trainings, I think it does a lot of great work for you because you can't control that. So along with like making sure you feel like, okay, I'm just trying to get healthy and get so as solid as I can. And I'm on this path you can alter like, so when you're in a training like that, you could do maybe more than you could do in a training where it's like, everything is so regimented and you're sweating for minute four or five on, you know, it's different maybe because you don't have the ability, but you do even there, you know? So I, I would say to you also, maybe something to try to do rather than just the, the mentality swift or switch, right? Is try to add that in, see if that works for you. Like pick somebody who's the next best attacker, next best, next best server, or the setter and have a game with the setter. Like, I bet you I'm going to get to block this girl if you set her again. You know, uh, anything, whatever it is, try to do it. Libero, best passer on the other team, try to serve them some balls and say, if I ace you this many times, I'm going to, you know, like you have to do push-ups or whatever. Try to make a game out of it so you don't get lost in the, the murkiness of crap trainings because I've been through many of them in my career. Okay. Um I was waiting for the for the go. Uh, if I knew, like, when I was playing uh, a group like that, I for sure will will be in because as a player playing in different countries, you feel so alone. I used to feel so alone so many times, you know, knowing how to react. I, many times I thought that what I was feeling, I was the only one, and just perhaps listen to somebody else that was facing the same thing or similar, that will help me to 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 um, encourage myself and say, okay, go and not stay in that mindset, not stay in that position, just ways to go out. Then I I never thought about doing something like this, and I think this is powerful for athletes. Um, then I will I will say to my to myself, oh, go go and sign up for that <laughs> for the meeting, go. Uh, because it's, it's the moment to experience not only what is happening in you, but what other people and perhaps contribute to, to what other people are experiencing, other athletes. Thank you, Lorena. Anybody else? Me. I think it's such a great place to learn and to um, refresh yourself and can just kind of recalibrate what you're working towards and what you're uh, looking at. So I think it's just a really great resource to meet other people because uh, that's oftentimes really tough when you're overseas, you feel really lonely. And so just to have this community is such a great resource. Thank you. Taylor, Therese. Yeah, I am. I would say there's yeah. value just in like the speakers and experts you bring on like Therese and Sonia and Lorena like have years and years and years of playing professional volleyball and um, for your athletes Riot like that's what they need they have questions that are specific to the experience of an athlete who's playing in a different country overseas who is having maybe issues with their coaches or issues with their teammates or issues with experience experiencing injuries or whatever it may be. And like these women have so much knowledge to offer. Um, so it's a great place to just ask questions and um, find wis wisdom from um, people who have like years and years of experience. Thanks for sharing Taylor. 
I was just gonna say, um, it was so good. Like I wish that I had been on this toward the end of my career when I didn't really know what was wrong with me. Now I know I had huge fear of failure and anxiety issues, but had I had been on this and heard Taylor tell me about this website that I can go to, after being in these talks, maybe I would have realized that that's what I was feeling. Maybe somebody would have shared a story that had, oh wait, that's what I'm feeling, that I could have known what that was because at the time I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know that I had fear of failure. I didn't know, I just knew that I was scared, super scared of everything. And maybe if I would have been able to connect the two and then I would have been able to hear Taylor say, here's an, an outlet, here's a resource, tap into these people, they can help you. you know. And I wouldn't, my career would have been extended because I didn't finish my career because I wasn't physically able. I had ended my career because of my mental part. And so this is just a huge resource just hearing from other players saying it's okay to not be perfect. <laughs> and then having um, the guests on to say, here's, here's where you can get help. <laughs> you know, here are some tricks that'll help you. Not only is it okay to not be perfect all the time, there are other people like that, but here's some things that worked for us. So I just think it's awesome, Ryan.